Father, well, we thank you once more for your great love towards us. We pray that as we continue to open our minds and hearts to your spirit, that you will take us back to where the pioneers were and then beyond that. We thank you. For all of your goodness, we pray that you will draw your people to yourself. May we be of help in that process. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Probably for the next two meetings, we're going to be dealing with one word. The word is Socinianism. Now, if you're not familiar with that word, don't feel bad. Because it seems to be an invisible word to the Adventist church. As a matter of fact, the leadership doesn't know what that word really means. They think they know what it means, but they don't see that they're doing it. They have no idea. They're doing that word. Now, this will become more clear as we go along here because, as I mentioned last time, I am not going to tell you anything that's coming out of me. I am going to be reading the words of the pioneer to show what they knew, and all of them knew what Socinianism was, is, and every one of them viewed it as a heresy and wrote against it and talked against it. And so that's what we're going to do, is just read their words. That's a long time ago. They knew what we don't know today. We've lost it. But it's very important, this one word. Now, as I mentioned, today we are beginning an in-depth study of the atonement. And before we begin that study, I would like to just remind you of a couple of statements that you are quite aware of. One is in Great Controversy 488. Satan invents unnumbered schemes to occupy our minds, that they might not dwell on the very work with which we ought to be best acquainted. The arch deceiver hates the great truths that bring to view an atoning sacrifice. Now, she did not say the atonement. She said the atoning sacrifice. That is a particular event in human history. And that is a very important event. That's Jesus on the cross. The atoning sacrifice. He does not want us to understand the sacrifice. Now, we all think we understand it. But maybe we don't. Because the word Socinianism is about that sacrifice. And you'll see more of what I'm talking about as we go along here. And the all-powerful mediator. Now, that's a, two, two things, the sacrifice and the mediator. Do you see how she combined that into one sentence? That's two completely different things, the sacrifice and then the mediator. Satan knows that with him everything depends on his diverting minds. From Jesus. From who? Did she say the Trinity? From God? No. She said from Jesus and his truth. Those who would share the benefits of the Savior's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. And we've already seen that spiritualism hates holiness. All right. Uh... I'm going down now. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. Now, when she said sanctuary, what did she mean? Did she mean all the furniture? I don't think so. Did she mean... Well, I won't go through all the things the sanctuary teaches. She brought it down to one thing, the investigative judgment. That's what we must understand, is the investigative judgment. And we don't teach it anymore. The investigative judgment is kind of a, well, you can't prove that from the Bible, so leave it alone. We don't need that anyhow. 
Jesus knows who who are his. I mean, it's strange all the arguments you hear when you talk to leaders. And I have talked to a few. <laughs> okay, so I'm on a, I'm still not down to where I want to get you in this statement. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Now, was Jesus a high priest on the earth? Couldn't be. You have to have blood to be a high priest. So he had to go to heaven to be the high priest. So here's something very important. Otherwise, it will be impossible. Do you get that word? She didn't say difficult. <laughs> kind of hard. She said impossible. It will be impossible for them to exercise the faith. And whenever you see those two words together, don't think she's talking about faith. She's talking about the faith. The faith of Jesus. That's a Seventh-day Adventist phrase. The faith of Jesus. You will not be able to be a Seventh-day Adventist. It will be impossible. If you don't understand what's going on in heaven with Jesus, the high priest, and the investigative judgment. Have you ever heard that before? That it's impossible to be a Seventh-day Adventist if you don't know those things? She just said it. So then she says, which is essential at this time, are to occupy the position which God desires them to fill. What position are we supposed to fill? The third angel's message. We are supposed to be the third angel ourselves. You cannot be the third angel's, and you cannot give the third angel's message if you don't understand Jesus is in heaven right now making the atonement. Now, that's very important. She said all this in Great Controversy 488. Now, I want to read you another statement here from Sermons and Talks, the first volume. And I and I would like to spend the whole time just on that one sermon, but I'm just going to pull out one little paragraph. <laughs> okay, this is on page 343 is where I'm beginning. Our ministers must be very careful not to enter into controversy in regard to the personality of God. Personality of God? That's a big deal with her? Yes, it is. There is no gospel if you don't have a God who has a personality. <laughs> okay? The personality of God. This is the subject they are not to touch. So she says to the ministry, leave this alone, talking about the personality of God. Why did she say that? Because that has to do with his nature. And we are not to know the nature of God. We never will understand the nature of God. But we do know who he is. Okay? We know who he is. He's the Father. <laughs> he is the God of Jesus. He's the Creator. We are to know who God is, but we cannot get into His nature. Okay? Now, she goes down a little further. She says, we know. Who's the we? We know that Christ came in person to reveal God to the world. God is a person, and Christ is a person. That's what she just said. How many does that make? <laughs> it doesn't make three. And it doesn't make three and one. A person and a person makes two persons. And she never says anything otherwise. Never. So let's continue reading here. Um, she said, don't send your children to Battle Creek. What was that Battle Creek? A man who had just become a Trinitarian and was destroying this church with that idea a little bit at a time, including the ministry around Battle Creek. I'll get to that. Uh, when Living Temple came out and some of our ministers told me there was in it nothing but what I had been teaching <laughs> all my life, I saw how great the danger was. Our own ministers don't see what he's doing. They see nothing wrong with the Trinity. 
I saw that blindness had fallen upon some who had long known the truth. I pray that the Lord will open the eyes of these ministers, that they may see the differences between light and darkness, between truth and error. Then later she says, the foundation of our faith, which was established by so much prayer, such earnest searching of the scriptures, was being taken down, pillar by pillar. It starts by accepting the Trinity. Do you see it? She's giving us the sequence here. Our faith was to have nothing to rest upon. She saw where it went. She says, the sanctuary was gone. The atonement was gone. Well, that's our subject. We want to know where it went, why, and who knew better. That's what we're doing here for the next few weeks. Now then, in order to make this easy for you to study for yourself, I'm going to give you a source I alluded to last time, but I'm going to give it to you plain this time so you can know where to look to study this and know what the pioneers taught. Because you can't get it just by listening. You have to look at it and see, that's what he really said. The man is J. Joseph Wagner, the father of Ella. And if you look in the CD, the, 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 the Ellen White disc under the Pioneers, and you look up Wagner and call up all his works about the, the second one is The Atonement. There's where we're going to be drawing sentences from so you can know this is what the Pioneers believe. This is what they said. This is written down. Nobody can change it. Okay, I'm going to show you how important it is today by reading uh, in one of the sections. Now, there is a lot of valuable material, and I mean valuable, stuff you've never seen or heard before in the first four chapters. They're beautiful, and I wish we could spend time with all of them. What we want to look at today is the fifth chapter. I'm not going to tell you the title. <laughs> if I told you the title, we wouldn't need the meeting. <laughs> the subject is, who died on the cross? Now, do you think that has something to do with Adventism today? Do we understand that today as a people? Does anybody preach it? Who died on the cross? Well, let's see what all the pioneers preached while they were alive. All of them. All the time. It was Seventh-day Adventism. It's the third angel's message. You cannot have justification by faith if you don't know who died on the cross. Okay? So let's start reading. Some effect to think it derogatory to the character of God that his son should suffer for us. Now, this man knew something right off the bat, because today you ask any Trinitarian, they'll tell you God cannot suffer. They will tell you God cannot die. They will tell you lots of interesting things about God that God never said. <laughs> but they say it, because they're theologians. So, so let's look at this. He says some some are like that. They don't they don't like it that maybe the Son of God should suffer for us. By the way, he doesn't say Jesus, he doesn't say the Messiah. He, he says right off the bat, the Son of God, because that's all they knew. <laughs> you read anything by the pioneers, that's the way they talk all the time. No given that. All right, so let's continue here. It says, the Lord has said that death was the penalty of transgression and that his law should not be set aside nor its penalty relaxed, for he would by no means clear the guilty. Was it necessary for God to keep his word? Sin is death, and there's nothing that can change it. Nothing. Sin is death. The guilty must die. Uh, 
Reason attests that the salvation of a sinner can only be effected by providing a willing and honorable substitute. The Bible attests that God gave his own son, and the son gave himself to die for us. So what do you suppose this man believes? That Jesus died for us. That's the only thing he knows from the Bible. He doesn't care what any of the churches teach. He doesn't care what any theologian says. The penalty for death, excuse me, the penalty for sin is death. And Jesus came to take the penalty. He died. Who is it that came? He just said it two times. The Son of God. This is the way pioneers talk. No Trinitarian in the world ever talked like this. None. Ever. This man is not a Trinitarian. <laughs> we think that all who have read carefully our remarks upon the requirements of a moral system, we that's in the first four chapters, must accept the conclusion that a substitutionary sacrifice is the only means whereby the broken law may be vindicated or the honor of the government maintained. Now, I'm missing a lot of information here. You have to go read the whole thing for yourself, but I want to hit some very important statements. Uh, it says that their sacrifices, the Jews, under the Levitical law, were indeed offered year by year continually, but on the Day of Atonement, the offerings of which were the heart and substance of the whole system, a goat was offered for all the people. Now, did you notice he said the whole system? He didn't say feasts and sacrifices are two different things. He didn't say that because it's not true. The whole system. There are lots of people who are missing little sentences like this. I'm not going to read you what he says about Paul talking about that. He, he fa falls on this word goat. A goat is not as valuable as a man. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> a goat is not as valuable as a man. His blood or life is not as precious as a great word as the blood of life of a man. How much less could a goat answer as the just equivalent of the whole nation? And then when you go that, the whole world, see, see where he's going? What good is a goat? If the government of God should offer to accept the life of a goat in his stead, me, you, am I, he would inquire, of so little worth that I can be ransomed by a goat? <laughs> Isn't that a good question? You mean that's all it takes for me to get eternal life with a goat? <laughs> How different would be the case if the government should announce the law was so just, so sacred, and its violations so odious in the sight of the lawgiver and of all loyal subjects that nothing less than the life of a prince royal could be accepted as a substitute for the transgressor. That announcement, oh, what it do to a person? That will take a prince to ransom me. That makes a difference, doesn't it? All right. So he's building something here. It says, it says, the value of the atonement, its efficacy as a vindication of the justice of the law and the honor of the government consists entirely in the dignity of the offering. Now, you just get that thought. That's very, very important. That offering has to be so great that it upholds the law of God. Now, she did not say, or he did not say, that offering has to be so great that it can save you. That's not the issue. That's not the issue. The issue is the law of God. Oh, now he is talking like a true Bible student. This man is talking like a true third angel person. 
It's none of this wishy-washy sentimentalism. Oh, save me, God. Oh, save me. Forget the rest of the world. Save me. No. The issue is God himself. The law. The law and his government. That's the issue. So let's see here. This uh, is by no means a reflection on the requirements of the sacrifices of the Levitical system. If considered as a finality, as having no relation to anything to follow, they do appear, uh, indeed appear insignificant and entirely worthless. So, so much for the Jewish system as far as getting something really done. He says, it's worthless. That's the way all the pioneers talk. But if considered as types, now didn't we go through that? But if considered as types of a greater offering, as illustrations of man's deserts for his transgression and of God's abhorrence of sin by which the sinner subjects himself to the penalty of death, they served a useful purpose. So they were lessons. They were illustrations. They didn't do anything. So why should we go back and pick them up again if they didn't do anything? They're not going to do anything now. <laughs> okay, I don't want to get back, go back in too many subjects here. But we want to see that our pioneers saw clearly the truth in all of its aspects. They didn't miss as they went through talking about things. Um, it says, in referring to Daniel, he, and in Isaiah, wounded for our transgressions, it says, how impressive are the words of the prophet. Quote, therefore I will divide him a portion of the grave, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto his death. He did what? Poured out his soul. That's the word. Unto death. That means you're really dead. Okay? Now he's moving here very consistently. But he's going someplace with this because he knows there is such a thing in the world as a trinity. And he's going to show that trinity is no good. He's going to show that by this process of going through the scripture. We insist. And we think with the very best reason that the Mosaic law reaches its logical conclusion only in the Christian system. Even as the prophecies of an exalted sacrifice find their fulfillment in Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David. And the objection raised against the idea of the son of God dying for man for transgression of his father's holy law is as contrary to reason as it is to the scriptures. What a sentence! What a sentence! When people are against the idea of the Son of God dying, are there any of those? <laughs> yeah, he names them. Way back there when the pioneers were all alive. When Helen White was alive, and if this was a wrong statement, she would have stood up and started hooting and hollering. Not a word against it because she believed the same thing. The Son of God dying for man for the transgression of what? His father's, he had the father. His father's law. There's the issue. Jesus died for the for transgression of the law. That's the issue. It's, uh, I can't break his senses down. He talks like Ellen White. He goes a whole paragraph in one sentence. Um, the offering, I'll just break it down the end of it. The offering of the Son of God is our ransom. That's how he ends a sentence I'm trying to break into. Okay, now, let's get down to where he's going. The law of God must be honored. You see, we, we learned before that there is no government without law. And if there's no penalty to the transgression of the law, the law is no good. And the penalty must be inflicted. It must be. There's no give. It has to happen. Or else there's no more law. There's no more government. So here he's saying the law of God must be honored. And vindicated by the sacrifice offered for its violation. Therefore, the death of Christ, the Son of the Most High. Can he say that any plainer? 
the death of Christ, the Son of the Most High, shows the estimate which he places upon his law. So there it is. Only, only the Son of God could die because the law is that exalted. Nobody else in all creation can die to satisfy the law because the law is a transcript of God's character, you see. So he's pointing us to the real object of the atonement. And here all the time we thought it was to get us saved. <laughs> because that's what all the ministers teach. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Spirit of Prophecy teaches. And it's not what any of the pioneers taught. None of them. We are learning the truth here. It says the death of Christ most high shows the estimate which he placed upon his law. We can have correct views of either the offering of the law only as far as we have correct views of the other. Now, as the glory of God was the first great object of the gospel, is that what the gospel is? Is for the glory of God? I thought it should get me saved. <laughs> now, it's very important that we be saved, yes, and God loves us. But there are issues we haven't thought about clearly. The gospel is about the glory of God. And God is the Father. <laughs> it's not the Trinity. It's the Father. So let's keep reading here. Uh, as we have seen, the honor of the law must be the chief object of an atonement. The chief object. We shall best be able to estimate the value of the law of God by having just views of the price paid. Now, he's not only talking biblically. There's no other way to make sense of the atonement. You can't get a proper view of what an atonement is if you don't see what the issue is and what a great price it was to save the issue. They only can properly appreciate the gift of Christ who rightly estimate the holiness and the justice of that law for which he died. Are you beginning to sense that's a different gospel than you've heard? Are you beginning to catch it? This has to do with who God is. That's the great controversy. See, Satan said God is selfish. No, God is maintaining the law, which is his character for all the universe to be safe forever so that love can be the thing that makes it all operate and there's harmony. Okay, I'm not going to get off into all the things I see in these senses. I want you to understand these senses were said by a pioneer who's telling us what all the pioneers understood and they all taught. And I'm reading his words because I think that's much better than me saying my words. <laughs> okay. His words are beautiful here because they're the truth. What then was the sacrifice offered for us? Ah, oh, here, here he goes. What then was the sacrifice? The price paid to rescue us from death. Did Christ, the Son of God, die? Or did a human body die? <laughs> now, have you ever heard that one before? <laughs> this is what I'm asking now. It must have been a problem way back then. Somebody was saying it. No Seventh-day Adventist ever said it, but somebody was saying it, or he wouldn't raise the issue. Was it Jesus, the Son of God, that died, or was it a human body that died? And God's exalted Son, leave it in the hour of its suffering. Now, I'm not going to take the time right now, but I can show you in our own writings today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church's theological writings. They teach 
that the Son of God, they don't even call him the Son of God, that, that divinity, they say, because they have a quote for that, divinity did not die, divinity cannot die, so they say divinity left the body, human body, when it died. That's what we teach, and that's what he's fighting against. That's what all the pioneers fought against. That's what Alan White writes against. But you're never going to hear it in a Seventh-day Adventist pulpit. Never. That Jesus, the Son of God, died. You're never going to hear it. Now, let's stay with Wagner here. He asks a question. If the latter be correct, it will greatly detract from the the value and dignity of the atonement for the death of a mere human being. However sinless would seem to be a very limited sacrifice for a sinful race. But however that may be, we should not question God's plan if that was his plan, that just a human died. See, it's a, but what say the scriptures? That's what we, oh, we must inquire. It is by many supposed that the pre-existent being, the Son of God, could not suffer and die. But that he left the body at the moment of its death. <laughs> now, does this man know the issues or doesn't he? <laughs> but the pioneers were stupid. They were unlearned. They were uncredentialed. They had no degrees. They, uh, Come on, folks. These men know more than any scholar I have ever talked to or read. And I challenge any scholar to deny this statement that there are people who say the pre-existent Son of God did not suffer and die. He left the body at the point of death. I challenge them to tell me nobody's saying that. He continues. In the middle of a sentence, it's, he says, it was only a release and an exemption from the state of humiliation. That's what people are teaching. He would not be humiliated by being the price on the cross. It would only be the human man. This would hardly justify the scripture declarations of the amazing love of God in giving his son to die. For the sins of the world. The Methodist discipline has a statement concerning the Son of God, which we think is quite in harmony with the Scriptures. Okay, I'm going to read that statement. Now remember, Alan White was a Methodist. As a matter of fact, in one of the latest books out, to try to prove she changed her mind, they say she's just going back to her Methodist roots. Well, that's ridiculous. She never went back to anything. She went forward with Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to read you what the Methodist, not the Methodist Church teaches today because they've done the same thing we have, but what the Methodists originally taught. Okay? I'm going to read you their original teaching. The, the whole and perfect nature, that is to say, the God and the manhood were joined together in one person. Never to be divided. <laughs> Whereof is one Christ, very God and very man, who truly suffered, was crucified, dead and buried. That is original Methodism, and that is the truth. And there is no doubt that Alan White heard that original Methodism. Okay? So let's continue here. The view which we call in question supposes there were two distinct natures in the person of Christ, but we do not so read it in the sacred oracles. Now, he doesn't mean what we mean by that or what the Methodists meant by it. It says, but if it be so that there are two distinct natures united for a season, that's what he means. Two natures that never were really joined. They always stayed separate, never blended. He says, we don't read that anywhere in the Bible. They were blended. They were combined, never to be divided. It says, uh, but if it be so, if they were united for a season and separated at death, 
We must learn it in the Revelation. It says, what What terms do we find in the Bible? In other words, what, what, where do we see this? Then he says, whoever attempts to answer these questions will find the position utterly untenable that, that the two natures separated at the death. You're not going to find that in the Bible. It's not there. Christ, he has that he quotes, Christ expresses both combined. Now that's Seventh-day Adventism. That's the Bible. Christ, the Son of the living God. Now where did we hear that before? Christ, the Son of the living God. That's Matthew 16, 16. When Jesus asked, who do you say I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. My Father, my Father, Jesus has a Father. He showed you in your spirit that I'm the Son of the living God. So, so here this man is saying it. Wagner's saying it. Christ, the Son of the living God, the man, Christ Jesus, both refer to the same person. <laughs> There are no forms of speech to express his personality higher than the Son of God or Christ. And the scriptures declare that Christ, the Son of God, died. So who did he just say died? The man and the Son of God combined, one person, died. That's what the pioneers all thought. I'm skipping down, so we're missing part of his argument. It says, the first of the above quotations says, the word was with was God. Okay, so that's John 1. That's what he was talking about. And also the word was with God. Now, it needs no proof. Indeed, it is self-evident that the word as God, that now he's talking about Paul, was not the God he was with. And as there is but one God, the term must be used in reference to the word in a subordinate sense, which is explained by Paul calling the same pre-existent person the Son of God. That's confusing because he's using two different scriptures here. This is also confirmed by John saying the word was with God, the Father. First John 1, 2. Okay, that's First John 1, 2. Also calling the word his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 3. Now, it is reasonable that the son should bear the name and the title of his father, especially when the father makes him his exclusive representative to man and clothes him with such power by whom he made the world. I'm not going to go through all of this. It's a beautiful argument. Uh... Okay, a little further he says, the scriptures teach that this exalted one, the one he has just shown, is the Son of God. This exalted one was the identical person that died on the cross. And this consists, in it this consists the immense sacrifice made for man, the wondrous love of God and condescension of his only Son. So Wagner here is showing Consistently through the scriptures that the person who died on the cross was the Son of God, the Divine Son of God, and the human combined as one person. The Bible calls him the man Christ. The man Christ Jesus. So the person that died on the cross, according to the pioneers, who are quoting the Bible, and of course the spirit policy says the same thing, was the divine Son of God and the man together. Who was it that died? The one which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon in our hands of handle. Well, who is that? That's the one who came from heaven. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, this is plain language and no parable. It just says, it's not a, a metaphor that Jesus came from heaven and took on humanity. He became in the form of a man. They were together. One person. 
This is not a metaphor. The Son of God is not a metaphor. The combination is not a metaphor. But that's what we all teach today. It's a metaphor. Well, Wagner says it's no parable. <laughs> he must have heard this thing about a metaphor someplace. There's no, this is no parable. The angel announced to Mary that her son Jesus should be called the son of the highest. And the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. Not that the Son of the Highest should dwell in and inhabit that which should be born in her, but her Son was the Holy and preexistent One. Hmm? Thus, by the energy of the Holy Spirit made flesh. Now, if the human nature of Christ existed distinct from the divine, the foregoing declarations will not apply to either. For if that were so, the pre-existent word was not made flesh. It was not the man, nor the fashion of a man, nor did the man, the servant, ever humble himself or devise, divest himself of divine glory, nor having possessed it. But allowing that the word, the divine Son of the Most High, was made flesh, took on in the seed of Abraham, and thus changed the form and the manner of his existence, by the almighty power of God, all becomes clear and harmonious. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> he changed the form. Where did he get the form? Hebrews 10 tells us, A body thou hast prepared me. God made his human body. So the likeness of sinful flesh does not mean he was sinful flesh. It says he had a body that looked like sinful flesh. But he did have the true nature of humanity. We won't get into that again. The point is, these pioneers all understood the truth. And the way they said it makes it clear they were not confused. Having noticed the humiliation of the exalted Son of God, we come to the question at issue, who or what died for man? He's going to clear this up. <laughs> Who died for man? The answer is, no messing around, the answer is Christ, the Son of the Most High, the pre-existent one that was with God in the beginning, the Word who was made flesh. Who died on the cross? The Son of God who was made flesh. He changed his form, see. It was not the man that died for us. It was the Son of God who had the form of a man. It was the Son of God. And he says that point blank, there's no mistaking what he has just said. Indeed, if the incarnation of the Holy One is not therein revealed, it cannot be revealed at all. So Sinianism is the only result. There's our word. There's our word. The pioneers all understood that word. And they said, so Sinianism is the only thing that happens if you say the Son of God did not die. And that's the truth. If you don't believe the Son of God, Jesus, the pre-existent Son of God, died, if you don't believe that, you are a Socinianist. And that's horror because everybody knows that's a heresy. Everybody knows that. Let's keep reading. The Son of God died for our sins. In Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, that's a verse, by the way, that all Trinitarians use to prove the Trinity. He's going to use it to prove it's not. He is called the Son given. Now, who would that be? <laughs> the Son given. The child born. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And he is to sit upon the throne of David. These expressions clearly identify the anointed of God, Jesus. I'm not going to go through his whole argument there. It's another beautiful argument. You go look it up. 
Therefore, that exalted one referred to in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 shed his blood or laid down his life for us. So the one that Isaiah talks about, that son that's given, the, the, the pre-existent son that's given, not the son that he became, he gave his blood, his life. The angel said he would save his people from their sins. Now, that's another argument he makes another time. That's an amazing thing. He saves people from their sins. Well, if he saves them from their sins, how are they supposed to live after that? Do they keep saying, I have to sin a little bit? <laughs> Do they say, I will never overcome? Do they say, you can't be perfect? You can hear all of that on Sabbath at the services. It's not what the Bible says. I better get away from that sentence for now. Let's stay with Wagner. Okay, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. It speaks of Christ as being in the form of God. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, was made in the likeness of man, humbled himself, and he became obedient unto what? There it is. It was always in Philippians, the second chapter. He came and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so here's Wagner's question. We appeal to the candidate, is not all this spoken of one person? <laughs> or did one person humble himself and another become obedient to death? <laughs> That's the way it has to be. If just one died, it's going to be the human and the other one left. That's to be the, the divine Jesus. That's ridiculous. And this man knows anybody who can think will see how ridiculous it is. Now, I'll read you one that you've all read hundreds of times, and we've used it here many times, but we're going to pull out of that one scripture what the pioneers always saw when they saw it. Hebrews, the first chapter, those first five verses, uh, it says, um, Paul says of the Son, quote, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Redemption through His blood. Who's, who's His? We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God. Who is that? The man was not the image of the invisible God. The human body was not the image. Only the pre-existent Son of God is the image. So he's, Wagner's pointing out here in Hebrews 1, it says so plainly, the one who died was the one who is the image of the invisible God. <laughs> By him were all things created. Oh, did the man do that? Of course not. By him were all things created. It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things to himself. We're moving through a lot of scriptures here. And every one of them say who the him is who died. It's Jesus. By him we are reconciled. Now we're going to spend maybe our whole time talking just about the word reconcile and atonement because they mean two different things. But they're not used that way today. So let's keep going here. Jesus in his own personal testimony. Now you get this down and you use this when you're talking to people who are re willing to listen. Not, don't fight with anybody. But if you have an honest soul who wants to know, you tell them about Revelation 1, verses 17 and 18. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth. And was dead. <laughs> Who's talking? Who's talking? <laughs> it's the risen Christ. Is anybody going to say that's only a human? Is there anybody foolish enough to say that? It is Jesus as God saying, I was dead and I'm alive. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the one that was dead. 
It is abundantly shown that Christ, the Son of the Most High, the Word by whom the worlds were made, in whom all things consist, the first and the last, the image of the invisible God, in whom all fullness dwells, was made flesh and laid down his life to purge us from sin and to redeem us to God by his own blood. I don't know of anybody in the world who can argue about that, anything about it. So then, the value of the atonement consists in the dignity of the offering. A human, no matter how holy he is, does not have that kind of dignity. Then he gets into another argument that he's argued before about justice. It says, we're a part of the human race, unfallen, or free from sin. They could make no atonement for the other part, inasmuch as they would still be the creatures of God. And the service of their lives would be due to him. Therefore, should they offer their lives to God for their fellow creatures, they would offer that to which they had no no right, no absolute right. He who owes all he possesses cannot justly give his possession to pay the debts of another. <laughs> and the reasoning is beautiful. You can't get past that kind of reasoning. The life of an angel would be utterly inadequate for the redemption of man. Now, do you recognize any of these statements? These are things that Alan White says over and over, especially in uh, Two-Spirit of Prophecy, page 9, where she says, the offering must be of superior value to Adam before he fell. Before he fell. So how, how could a man who was fallen flesh be superior to Adam before he fell. That's absolutely impossible. Jesus was never fallen flesh. He had our fallen flesh. The word our changes it. It's not him. It's our fallen flesh. It's Adam's fallen flesh. It's the sinful race's fallen flesh. It was not his fallen flesh. You need to study that sometime. Because these little words get twisted around, and when you hear a minister say them, you remember what the minister said instead of what the Bible says. Don't do that. Don't do that. You better read for yourself. And when God tells you this is what this means, if if 10,000 people say, no, it doesn't, you say, well, I'm sorry, but a 1,000 shall fall at my right hand and 10,000 at my left hand. Yeah. You remember that scripture, too. 10,000 are going to fall, and you're not if you have the truth. Continuing, there was one being to whom this reasoning and these remarks would not apply. And I, I left out all of that, but let me get down to what he's saying. It was the Son of God. He was the delight of the Father, glorified with him before the world was adored and worshipped by angels. All creatures were made by and for him, and he upheld all things by the word of his Father's power. That was in eternity past. It was by the Father's power. He sought with him upon the throne from which all law proceeded. He possessed the requisite dignity to magnify and to vindicate the honor of the law of his father in suffering the penalty. He, he was the truth as well as the life. And he said the law of his father was in his heart, which was a guarantee he would do no violence to the law himself, but would shield it from desecration and rescue it from reproach, even to the laying down of his life in his behalf. He was so well acquainted with his father's holiness and justice that he could realize as no other could the awful condition of the sinner and the terrible desert of his sin. He was so pure and exalted. That's not what certain confused people say. They say, oh, he was just like God. Come on, folks. 
Somebody better wake these people up sometimes. Yeah. Jesus was not just like that. He was pure and exalted. And if they think they're pure and exalted, they better go visit somebody. Because they have a major problem. <laughs> they are not pure and exalted. That is a deception beyond all deceptions. He was so pure and exalted that his sufferings and death would have the desired effect upon the minds of those who are the recipients of his grace to produce in them an abasement of themselves. There it is. When you know Jesus, you never think you're holy. You can't think that. It's impossible. And they have an abhorrence of sins which caused him to suffer and thus to guard against a future rebellion amongst them whom he redeemed. There's the real atonement. When the real atonement happens, there is no more sin. So now you know why you don't have the real atonement yet. Or you'd have no chance of salvation anymore. The atonement is when the sins are all blotted out and no more can ever happen. We're not there yet. The atonement has not happened. The sacrifice for the atonement, the sacrificial atonement has happened. But that allows us to be justified. But as all the pioneers said, they must have listened to each other all the time. Justification is not a final issue. Justification is the beginning of your salvation process. But justification does not save you. And that's what all the Sunday keeping churches teach, and now we're teaching it. I'm going to spend a whole time on talking about what biblical justification is and what happens when you really get it. Maybe it won't be me at all. I'll just read Wagner because he has a chapter on that. I'll just read Wagner when we do that. Um, he left the throne of glory. Do you know that no Trinitarian believes that? No real Trinitarian. The people who are not really Trinitarians don't know what they believe. They just say I'm a Trinitarian because that's what the church teaches. But they don't really even know what a Trinitarian is. Real Trinitarians teach that, that God cannot be separated. There's three people who are actually one person, and since they're one person, they always have to be together. So nobody ever left heaven. But here, Wagner says, he left. He left the throne of glory and of power, and took upon him the nature of fallen man. In him were blended the brightness of the Father's glory and the weakness of the seed of Abraham. In himself, he united the law giver to the law breaker, the creator to the creature. Do you see that? Jesus joined the creation. The, the creator became a creature. That's beyond us. But Wagner understood. He just saw that. He was made sin for us. In other words, we got his, uh, he, he got our sin. He never sinned. He never became sin as the King James makes it appear in 2 Corinthians. He became our sin. That's the complete thought. He never in himself ever became sin. He was always holy. But he paid the price for us because he took our sin and made it his. That's another subject. Let's try to stay here. He humbled himself as it is not possible for any other to do. He was rich in a sense and to an extent that no other was. He had something to offer of value far beyond our compression, comprehension. And he freely gave it all for us. For our sakes he became poor. He left that glory to take upon himself grief and toil and pain and shame and to suffer even unto death 
a death the most cruel that the malice of his enemies could invent. And then he quotes somebody, I don't know where it is. O Lamb of God, was ever pain, was ever love like thine. He's quoting somebody but didn't say who. A poem in some place, no doubt. Oh, the depths and the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding us. With this clear testimony before us, we are better prepared to appreciate the law of God. Now, that's the job of Seventh-day Adventists, is to tell the world about the law of God, about the fact we have transgressed it, and that Jesus has paid the penalty, and now we are to have the faith of Jesus. But we can't understand the law of God until we understand the price that was paid to make it honorable. To the honor of what? Such an amazing sacrifice. If we estimate it according to the price paid for its vindication, we are lost in wonder and can only pray with David, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Psalm 119, verse 18. The law is holy and just, and without a sacrificial offering, man must have perished. And what an offering! The brightest ornament of heaven! by whom the Eternal Father made all things, who was worthy to receive the worship of angels, became obedient to death to redeem guilty man from the curse of his Father's law, thus showing to a wandering universe that the law cannot be set aside, nor is judgments reversed. Truly has the Lord fulfilled his promise to magnify the law and make it honorable. If God in justice spared not his son, his well-beloved son, in whom he greatly delighted, but let him suffer its penalty when he took its transgressions upon him, how can they hope to escape his justice and his wrath in the great coming day if they continue to transgress it? Reader, can you hope that God will be more favorable to you if sin be found upon you in that day than he was to his son? Oh, these pioneers. <laughs> they were there all the way with the truth. They all talked like Ellen White because they believed she had the spirit of prophecy and they knew what the testimony of Jesus means. You can't give up one part of the truth and not mess up the whole thing. Do not abuse his mercy because he grants the remission of sins that are past. Now listen carefully. The remission of sins that are past by claiming indulgence for sins in the future. That's why Romans, what is it? 825, the sins of the past, remission of sins of the past. When Jesus died, our penalty for sins of the past, he did not pay so we could sin in the future. That's the whole point of all of this for us. We realize that's what kept Luther going. He said, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. And he knew now he was free from the power of sin. He didn't have to sin anymore. He knew there's still the remnant of sin. That he had habits and things that he had to be working against and overcoming. But he knew I have been delivered from sin. He knew what we must know. Because of what Jesus did and we now have the remission of sins in our past. I stand as though I have never sinned. So why should I go back to it? <laughs> why should I go back? Paul says that's like a dog went back to his vomit. So here's the way he finishes. And I want to remind you, I have not been telling you my words, my interpretations, my understanding. I've been reading Wagner. 
And Wagner for us today represents the pioneers. They all talked like this. They all wrote like this. Go read them. See what, what they sound like. I'm going to finish now what he said. He will not save you in sin. He will not save you in sin, but from sin. While the carnal mind is enmity against God and not subject to his law, the Christian can say, I delight in the law of God. Wagner, the pioneers. Oh, we've got a long way to go to get back there. Father, thank you for this glimpse into what you showed the pioneers. It's all in your word. It need not be any kind of a mystery to us. You showed them through your word. You can show us exactly the same way. Help us to be true 1844 Seventh-day Adventists. Help us to know the spirit of prophecy is your voice. It is truly the testimony of Jesus. May we turn our back on all the man-made inventions, on all the traditions that have crept in, on all the sentimentalism, the, the, the fake holiness to the real thing. Here they are, those that keep the commandments of God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.